got kids. So um, I, I love I love where you live. How many times did you come, Eddie? I went every year for 16 years in a row. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's just... Yeah, it's, it's like me with King Island. I went there like 17 times. Yeah. I love that place. Uh, yeah. It uh, actually looks a lot like that picture in the background. And, and uh, where, where is that? Well, the one you see, you got all those white sand beaches with waves going around. Yeah, where, where were you saying you've been that looks like it? Oh, um, Martha Lavinia on King Island in Australia. Mm, it's yep. just this point it's a sandy point break where the waves come from both directions of the island and they a-frame everywhere it's, it's very cool where, where in australia is that uh tasmania that's okay. straight between tasmania and, and bells pretty much epic epic mm. well um should uh should we get started yeah actually speaking of martha lavinia just just for people to be aware it's under th it's under pretty grave threat from the Tasmanian government. Well, not so much Tasmanian government, but they but they're basically turning a blind eye. We've got this really gnarly commercial fish business in Tasmania. Ta There's a few companies, and they they basically farm salmon, and they wherever they farm, they damage the environment massively. <clears throat> and they want to they want to set up a fish farm right around the corner from Martha, and so. All the water flow is going to bring all the crap into Martha. It'll probably impede the sand flow, which creates the sandbar in the first place. It's going to end up bringing seals, and the seals will bring sharks and pollution. Horrible. They're, saying, they're saying they want to start with at least a million fish. If you've got a million full-grown salmon in, in, in um, t you know, cages over there, that's, that's the same as 10,000 people shooting in the water every day un unfiltered. That's just oh. one million. They're talking about starting with a million and going to three million pretty fast whenever they do get started. But yeah, they announced it a couple of years ago, and straight away I got on to, I got on the social media program and got all kinds of famous surfers that have been down there to chime in and say why well, the place needs to be saved and stuff. And they haven't really done anything about it in a couple of years, but I know that they're still planning on it, and the state government's well, well behind them. So got to keep that in people's you know, radar that that's going to go down, and we we don't want that to happen because it'll it'll ruin the place. But anyway, getting back to where we were. Yeah, and um, uh, just full disclosure, um, my uh, my youngest is in there being watched by my oldest. And my wife's still at work, so uh, hopefully uh, we don't get interrupted. But for some reason, if we if we do, or if you see me running out with the computer, um, it's all right. yeah, that's that's what's going. There's on. always editing for that. There is. In fact, I hear screaming happening right now. Hold on one second. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. What's the, what's up, what's up? What? Can, can, is that the youngest or the eldest? Yeah, this is the youngest and uh, oh. here's the oldest. So, um, so here's what we're going to do. What's that? Yo, look, it's Sean. Yeah. From Hawaii. He's all the way in Hawaii. Oh, there's the eldest. Neely, can you do this, please? Yes, Mickey. Adossus, can you hang out with Neely? Uh, no. Da, 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 da. Can you draw some way right here? Here, let's do some drawing. Can you do some drawing with them right here in the background? That would be sweet. Here, here, here. Okay, why don't you start drawing and then I'll I'll get this going. And then you you put them you I'll put them down and you draw. The okay. Um, over there, Sean. Sorry about this. I thought I had it all. Right. All right. You need a Kelix later pro surfer game that would keep him busy. <laughs> we don't do the video. Did you, game. Did you ever play that back in the day? I, I actually did. I did early two thousands. Yeah, that was a. That was I remember I played it back in the day, and I'm thinking, you know, this is actually, this is a little bit like you know when you. Uh, you do theory and then you do hands-on. The playing the game was a bit like theory, because the maneuvers, the stuff you could do back then was like, oh, they'll never do this. And they are. They're doing all that now. Exactly. But that right. game was it would have been like theory for some young kid wanting to get get it in his head and then go and do it. You know. Alito and all those Brazilians probably watched it when they were kids. They probably did too. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, we're gonna we're gonna roll with this and we're gonna get it get it going. Is that cool with you? Okay. okay. All right, all right. Uh the crowns go in the car and unlock it. The keys are on top of the microwave. Oh, yeah. Yeah, here. Just use these. Just use these. Okay. Sweet, sweet. Okay, let's um let me get my head together. All right, here we go. And action. Action. Hello. Welcome to episode 12. This is Speaking from Water. I'm your host, Sean Rutke, the show where we talk to the world's greatest water aesthetic professionals. And today we are extremely lucky to be with Sean Davey. He has over 40 years of experience traveling the world, countless covers from surfer, surfing, surfaholic. Um, the, the list is, is long and abundant. I remember uh, studying Sean's work when I was a, a young a young eight, nine year old in Washington DC, landlocked, just dreaming of the beach. And, uh, and today we, we have Sean here. Sean, welcome. Hello, oh, aloha as, as we say here in Hawaii. I've been here 20 years, but I haven't lost the accent. I've still got the full Tasmanian accent. The, the accent is strong and, and coming in. Uh, how, how are you doing today? Not too shabby. Are, are the waves, uh, how, how are the waves? Pretty shabby. But you know, it's been really good last month, so no one's complaining. I mean, I, I saw days this week that were, like probably by your local standards, all time. And there's just a couple of guys out. Because everybody's, you know, everyone's had a pretty good time. With the pigs at the trough for the last month, you know. Yeah, you, you, I've been watching it on the cameras. You've just been having just like the most epic, uh, epic winter. But um, mm. I, 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 I don't, I'm not even really a, uh, I'm not really a surf photographer anymore these days because there's not, you can't make a living off it. So, you know, one has to do what pays the bills. What? Surf doesn't really pay the bills at the moment, but every now and then I can maybe get a few shoots in here and there. And, you know, keep that, that, that dream alive somewhat. <laughs> well, I, I, I would say uh, looking back on your career, you've, you've totally nailed it on so many different levels and we're gonna cover all these little aspects. But um, before we get into uh, the, the, the nitty gritty- I, 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 I was just checking out the pit behind me there. Yeah, you, you are, you're completely <laughs> shocked. For those uh, that are listening, uh, Sean has a, a really epic shot he took in uh, Tahiti and it's just crispy blue and he's he's pitted totally pitted actually i called that one blue eye it's kind of like it's the eye of the way it's very blue so blue eye it is it's i had a, a lot of pictures actually start with the word blue and so i do green and gold and yeah. do, are the blue are the blue images uh your favorite and yeah, no, I couldn't say this. I shoot a very wide array of light. And these days I tend to um, chase the, the, the early and late hours, particularly the early hours, like when the sun's first coming up, because that's when the, the light's most dramatic. And also it's also, you've just had the, the overnight high tide which grooms all the foot, footprints off the beach and makes them all nice and clean again too so that's really good and there's hardly anyone ever on the beach at that time of the day so i've pretty much got it to myself so generally speaking that's when i like to shoot the most often is those early hours but i'm not opposed to a nice blue day like the one behind me here so that was yeah that was, that was actually a pretty standard wave at shaper that's like those come through all the time yeah, um, talking to your uh, early morning shots, I've been I've been noticing a lot of your work on Surfline lately, um, uh, over the winter at least. Um, some uh, some nice slow blurs. Uh, what can, can you speak to to that at all? As far as yeah, well, I've I've always been a fan of the blur, like what, I, like, I like to call them speed blurs. I think it's actually become a, almost a a standard term now in photography people people say speed blur people most people know what that is but um 
you know, like most uh, photographers, when they approach a sport, they, they, they think with the mindset of, of freezing the action. And usually that takes like, you know, thousandth of a second, five hundredth of a second, maybe. Whereas I liked, I like to, I've always had this thing about, you know, one of my mottos is to shoot different. And shoot, shooting different means, you know, don't be shooting the same stuff as everybody, everyone else on the beach. And especially when there's a whole bunch of photographers in town, which is how it used to be. You'd get about 50 guys coming from all over the world and they're all standing there with the big lenses. So we're all shooting the same thing. So, you know, I didn't want to be that guy shooting what everyone else is shooting, particularly back in the magazine days when we were giving them our, our, our slides and our films. They would, you know, they'd have a, they were typically, you know, surfer or surfing in those mags. They'd, they'd, they'd have a, one of their editors, photo editors walking the beach, talking to all the photographers and um, getting them to give them slides to take back to the magazine. And I knew that with so many photographers on the beach, you know, anything that was shot at a standard shutter speed, they're probably going to have 10 guys giving them that same photo. And my photo is not going to factor because I'm down that totem pole. Um, so at least at the time I was. Um, so I figured now I'd rather go with the slower shutter speed, get something a little bit more arty farty, a bit more eye catching. The downside is you lose a few shots because you don't get every shot perfect. But when you get a good one, magazine editors are going to take those shots every time because just about no one else is giving them that shot even if there's someone else in that pack also shooting slow shutter speeds he's it's just going to be a bit different even if he and I, even if he and i had exactly the same technique we'd still end up with different photos it's just the nature of the beast but yeah so i i shot mainly because i wanted to get my photos used but two I, I like to be arty farty, so you know that was definitely uh, um, not a hard, not a hard thing to do. In fact, I, I I love to shoot speed blues. It's it's become my forte now. Like when you see my when you do see my stuff online, especially if it's like recent, like on Surfline, there's a good chance there will be some speed blues going on there because that's really one of my you know people see it and I go, oh, that's a Davy shot. And I've actually noticed this season, because I've had a fair bit of stuff used this season, I'm seeing other pictorials online from other various other places, and I'm seeing more speed blues. So obviously it's striking a chord with, with other creatives to see that stuff. Because what's, what's really cool about the speed blue too is it not only produces a different looking photo, but it captures things that the regular shutter speed can't capture like the angle of trajectory because like a say i shot a photo at a 50th of a second instead of a thousandth that 50th of a second is capturing 20 times more time than the thousandth is that is just like right and the 50 is like so it's capturing 20 times more amount of time in that one exposure and so because of that it actually captures the angle of trajectory and and the um the uh what's the other word uh velocity was a faster shutter speed it's just going to hide all that because it's capturing only a thousandth of a second but that's kind of a little bit of you know details on slow shutter speed it's also, also called slow shutter and speed blues and and just technically, um, if you're doing that during the day, are you using a special filter to to uh, to dull the the daylight? No. no, no, not at all. Actually, most people when they do dabble in um, slow shutter or, or speed blues, they tend to do it when the light's really shit and they're not they're not really getting anything else, and say, so, "Oh, what the hell? I can take it risk because it doesn't really matter." And so most people when they shoot when they do shoot speed blues, they they don't really get great shots because they're not doing it in the ideal light and really the ideal light for shooting speed blues is at least here in hawaii is that first hour of light as the sun comes over the hill and it captures uh as the sun comes over the hill it glitters on the wave face you get the glitter going up the face of the wave and with a slower shutter speed when you're panning with the surfer like that those that glitter turns into streaks 
like welding streaks. You ever seen photos of people people welding? <clears throat> you can see all the weld streaks going everywhere. It's a little bit like that. So my advice is if you are going to shoot speed blues, try and shoot it at the time of the day where you'll see the glitter on the wave because it's nice to have those highlights. It really helps to accentuate it. Epic advice, epic advice. Mm. Um, now, Sean, uh, can you can you take us back a little bit into your history? Um, I want to know about Tasmania in the in the early days when you were first getting uh, going. Like, what what were those those beginning times like when you were like this This is me. This is what I want to do with my life. This is the this is question. my calling. What, There's what, a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> okay, well, my first experience with the ocean was, I was about three years old, one of five boys under five. Mum took us all down the beach one day and told us to sit on the beach, and she went and trotted off into the water. And the next thing I know, the, the ocean opened its mouth up and, and, and ate her, because this wave reared up out of nowhere and just broke clean over the top of it. And to me, it just looked like the ocean was this big creature that ate her, that ate her up. So that was my first experience with the ocean and with with waves, same thing. Uh, but it didn't stop me. I'm, I was always pretty fascinated by being by the seaside. It was just a cool place to be. I never never really understood why, but you know, even even the the, the rotting, uh, even the smell of the rotting kelp was a good thing, you know, because it, it meant I was near the ocean, where, wherever I smelled it. You know, it was. Yeah, I always had a, always I was always very interested in being by the ocean, and so I, it's pretty much it was inevitable that I was going to end up, you know, working in or on or or around it in some way or other. Uh, but uh, you know, as far as taking pictures was, uh, I got given this old Kodak Instamatic camera. I actually still got it here. It's an old throwback from the late sixties, early seventies. So you wind it here and then you press it here wow really really rudimentary camera i mean like super super basic the film was a cartridge that you used to pop into the back here hang on here we go what a tough time opening here we go yeah it would just go straight in the back oh you can't really see the camera here you go incredible yeah anyway, it's a real basic camera Anyway, so I started with one of these and uh, it wasn't long before I was really wanting to get in the water. So what I did was I, um, I, I was poor, so I couldn't afford to buy a water camera and they were pretty hard to come by anyway, especially back then. The only, the only real water camera there was, was the Nikonis and they were quite expensive, made by Nikon. Great cameras. Still and what year, cameras. I'm sorry, what year was this? Mid seventies. So, um, what I did was I got my cut against the manic and my mum used to drink this wine out of these wine casks that you'd buy, the cardboard box, right, square box, and you'd turn the tap and the wine would come out. Well, I, I took a, the, the bladder out of one of those and I cut it and cleaned it, obviously, but um, put my camera inside it and sort of sealed it with some tape and a, and a filter, like super basic shit, like it was never going to last. But um, anyway, I took it out to Bondi one day. This was, I was living in Sydney at this stage. And I took it out of Bondi one day. And I remember sitting out there. I was just taking a couple of pictures. And I'm thinking, cool, man. I'm a water photographer now. This is cool. But within five minutes, it was done. It was so fogged up from, from what water was getting in there that it looked like I was shooting in pea suit fog. So, yeah, that, uh, yeah, that was my first endeavor of getting into shooting in the water. It, yeah, gotten a bit better since then. I've had quite a few different cameras since that, since those days. How old were you at that point? Oh, about 15, 16, somewhere. Like so yeah. you you get home, you, how, how in those days did you process the images? You know, you, you're shooting blindly, I assume. You think you know you, what you're getting. You know, these well, days you take a water shot and you, you see it immediately on the back. Yeah, well, those, I just, yeah, I used to shoot slide film, and in those earlier days, I shot I shot on Kodachrome, which was like an amazing film, but it used to take forever to get it processed. You'd have to put it into a mailer and and post it off to Kodak, 
because they're, they're the only place in Australia that could even process it. It's a very, very detailed process. Um, and I would get those films back on average about in about three weeks' time. So the learning curve back then was super slow. Not like now. You screw up now, you see it in instantly, and you can you can change that and fix it on the spot. Bam, you're done. Back then, you screwed up, and you got your film back in three weeks. And it was like, Gee, what setting was I using back then? Oh, God, I, could, I can't even remember now. So the learning curve, it wasn't even a curve at times, you know. So, yeah, it was harder to learn shit with shooting film as opposed to shooting on digital where everything's instantly, you know, available to see. Like if you, you know, when you're shooting digital, if you, if you mess up the exposure, you can see it straight away and fix it. Whereas back in those old days, you'd just go off and shoot rolls of film blindly and get it back in a few weeks. Like, oh, didn't get, even get anything. <laughs> you know, it's like it was, it was different. And you only had 36 exposures on a roll. Like, um, I can remember when we were shooting film and if you had a really good day at the beach, you might have shot 10 rolls of film. That, that's what, 360 photographs. Most digital photographers shoot three, four times that much on any given day at the beach. I mean, you know, back then we had to be very sparing about it and we had to shoot the, precisely the right moments. And you had to be really on it as far as timing it. You couldn't just shoot blindly like they do now. Yeah, you know, people now, they just hold the button down. Brrr. Downside is when they get home, they're going to have to sift through thousands and thousands of images to find the good ones. So there, there, there is a, there is something to be said for being uh, patient and shooting just the right moment rather than just shooting everything that they see, which is what most people do these days. Yeah. So during during this time, did you have any inclination that you were gonna you were gonna be a, a professional photographer? Was that in your in your sights, or did you have another idea of what your life was gonna be like? No, no, no. Um, uh, you know, sure, I thought about being a professional. How cool it would be to you know work for the magazines and travel around and shoot the pros and have yeah, that'd be pretty neat, right? But I never really kind of thought too much uh, about that I was going to do that, it just sort of came to me. And it was really through persistence, just being passionate about doing something. If you're really good at if you're really passionate about doing something and you're good, you eventually rise to the surface. Someone will notice you and take you on. Oh. So it'll be a little bit harder now with surf photography because um, you know, there's so few magazines left. And so uh, what photographers there are now that are making a living off it are most likely working for the companies. You know, they're on a payroll or something like that. Freelance, the freelance situation is not really much of a situation these days if you want to make a living. Whereas back when I was doing it on film, especially on film, freelance was everything. It was the best shot. That's what got the gigs, you know. Oh yeah, like five five guys send the same pictures to the advertiser the advertiser got to use the best shot right that's how it was the best shot wins but then what happened with di when digital came along um uh suddenly everybody was a photographer and it became really obvious to the companies especially when kids parents were sending them photographs and they're like well why do we need to pay these professional photographers when we can just have anybody shoot one of these cameras you know and so what they were saying is we don't really need photographers. They don't really have skills that we need because anyone can do this. That's pretty much what they were saying. It was pretty kind of short-sighted of them to do it, but ultimately it it came about also because the industry was going public, like Billabong and Quicksilver both went public, and that's what really started to get them penny, pinching pennies all over the shop and you know the beginning of the end for us guys as far as being freelancers and you know making a living off being a freelancer, it's pretty tough. Well, before we go there, I want to know a little bit about this period of, of you transferring yourself to to Hawaii and how that came about, um, because that, that seems like a pretty large move and a, a humongous career building move for you in, in, in your life. What, what, what brought that about? That's funny, actually, because it wasn't really meant to be a career move. It was more about, I just, I just met, I, I, 
Well, look, I I didn't even intend to go to Hawaii because I I typically like to go to places that people don't go. So I, I had no intentions of really going to Hawaii, but then I got asked to go. Like I had a Japanese agent. She paid for my air ticket and gave me some money towards expenses and she wanted me to go over and shoot it. So I thought, okay, I'll go do it. No worries. And I ended up really liking the place. It was almost like a second home. It was, I just really dug the place. And, and then, I, then I I met my wife, my future wife. Um, and um, it was either one of us was going to have to move, I guess. And I didn't mind the idea of moving to Hawaii because I liked it, just because just I liked it, right? Um, it wasn't really a career move, believe me. Like when I first moved here, I thought, oh, they do things a little bit differently here and I'm going to be right at the bottom of that totem pole. I don't want to be on that totem pole. I'm and gonna... what year is this? Oh, 97. 97. Uh, because back then, I guess most of the photographers were feeding all their images directly through the magazines. Even to the advertisers, they went through the magazines and the magazines decided what to show the advertisers and then the advertisers used whatever they were given pretty much. And I knew being the new guy in town, I was going to be right at the bottom of that totem pole. And meanwhile in Australia, I'd already been dealing directly with advertisers for years. So I just just continued to do that. And I think I actually changed the industry over here in doing that, but it wasn't, wasn't in a bad way because it actually helped all, all photographers be able to avoid having, you know, the pictures hidden or not shown or, you know, if we're all just dealing directly with the advertisers, then that's a good thing because we're all getting to show our stuff. Um, what happened after that? Uh, oh, I'm missing the point somewhere here. Anyway, so uh, actually I did pretty good. You know, like once I, you know, realised, yeah, I could just continue what I was doing in Australia and, you know, I don't want to be on that totem pole. I'm just going to do what I've always done and it worked out pretty good. I was getting a lot of sales and all the advertisers knew me and, you know, they didn't really know many of the photographers because the photographers were all feeding their stuff through the magazines. So yeah, that, that helped me a lot actually, you know, cause I was, at first I was thinking, oh, this could be a bit testy. I didn't really think about, you know, am I going to be able to make a living here? <laughs> Young love. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it all, it all worked out. So looking back on your work from that period, your your barrel shots are, are some of the most striking images. Uh, and from from the standpoint of, of being in the water, um, those those are some also of the, the hardest shots to get. Um, getting yourself in a position where you you're able to take a photo of a surfer in a barrel is um it might look easy to the common um, uninitiated, but is actually one of the hardest things to do. Um, would you would you say that your ability to have to have done that then um, was uh, I don't know um, something that was very unique to your style, and a lot of guys might have propped themselves on the beach. Um, with, with, oh, everybody's uh, everybody is a little bit different to each other, and. It, it often comes down to just the equipment that you're using or, or you know like it might be a certain camera or a certain camera housing or that makes you shoot a certain way i mean like i remember when i first came to hawaii i was using a fisheye and i was actually using this really unorthodox method that particular season where i was body surfing the wave while shooting the photo of the surfer and I was doing that just so I could get that extra two or three frames, which sometimes makes the world a difference in that sequence. It's, you know, it's often it's the, best, it's the last shot or whatever. So I was I was actually body surfing the waves and shooting with the fisheye at the same time. And I remember it was one afternoon I, I was shooting off the wall. It was probably about five, six foot, really nice, clean, maybe, maybe five foot. It was really clean. And t I saw Tom Curran. and I'm like, oh, great, that's cool, you know, so... Sort of taken off this wave, and I body surfed into it and shot a sequence of him, and then kicked out. And there was Aaron Chang, and he was—he wasn't that happy because <laughs> I spoiled his shot, you know. And, yeah, and yeah. like he's one of the guys that I, that I looked up to when I was coming through. So, you know, it's like, oh, oops, uh, yeah, maybe that technique's not going to work, work too well here in Hawaii. <laughs> but well, yeah, you know, you know, everything's a little bit different, you know. 
it, you know, comes down to your, your approach, your technique, your, the equipment. Like, yeah, back, back then, especially in the film days, everybody was always getting the latest camera. You had to have the latest gear. You just had to. It, 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 it really didn't make any sense at all. I mean, the best camera is the, is the camera that you have in your hands. But, I mean, I could make any camera work and, and take pictures just as good as any other camera. It's really... Yeah, I just remember back then it was a, there was a fair bit of up and ship going on between the photographers. Oh yeah, I've just got the I've got the yes one in. That's the shit, you know. Like you got to get the one in. Forget the one, you know. And then after everybody got the one in, it's like oh no, I've got the one V. That's the guy, you know. That's that's the camera to have. So it's always been that way. It's now it's now it's with digital, you know. Same thing. So so you would definitely say then that going and doing and and doing the thing that you know gets the thing done the t- the um the, the the gear is second the it's it's all about the the action the main the main thing is to have the will to do it it's like remember you were saying how it's hard to get the sh- get, to get that shot well it is when you're younger and, and you and you don't have the experience and you and you don't you just don't know, have any experience to learn on how to do it but after you've been doing it for a while it's just second nature it's easy you know but yeah, I remember when I was younger, it was hard getting those shots. Those shots were really hard to get. I remember being stoked on the most mediocre of shots back then. <laughs> you know? Whereas now it really takes a, a pretty special photo to get me stoked. You know? And more often than not, the one the photos that, that I really like these days are the ones that capture atmospherical activity like rainbows and storms and you know, even the full moon setting over a pipe, it does that every two days every month. Sets right over pipeline. So you get these beautiful moon sets that are sort of glowing across the water. I've had a few of those in uh, used by uh Surfline this year. They've currently got one on the on their on that, their site now. That's what I was referring to there at the start of our conversation. Mm. Yeah, very, very epic shot. I'll that uh, shot I'll... yeah, that shot was taken in almost complete darkness. Um, really high ISA and a really slow shutter speed, probably maybe a 20th, 40th of a second. But I have taken them where they're like two seconds long and stuff too. You know, when you're shooting that low light, you can get away with a little bit of more movement. It's, it's a fine line, you know. To be, cre- to be creative is to take risks. But I'd much rather, you know, like... If I'm shooting for a client and I've got to get I've got to get photos of that latest board shot, well, no, I'm not going to take risks. I'm just going to do what they want, get the job done, and move on. But if I'm shooting for myself, I'm always going to be taking risks. That's where I get the really cool photos. And, and would you say that's the nature of the artist? This artist, yes. As opposed, <laughs> as opposed to uh, th- that, that would be the artist mentality, as opposed to say an editorial mentality where you're. You're going yes. after something that you want someone they they think that might like it as yes, opposed to yes. what you like. I know I I battled that I battled that all the way through my magazine career. I'm like, oh, I'd really like to do something creative right now, but man, I've got still got to nail the couple of shots of that guy, so I can't. I I, I have to stick with what I know is going to deliver, you know. But then you know, um, just the more and more I shot for myself, the the less and less that mentality went away and. It was replaced by always be creative, you know. Anything I shoot for myself, I'm always taking that creative path rather than the rather than the proven path. So I like to I like to uh, fight the laws of light, so to speak. It's like a, it's like you used to get film, and it, you would open the box up. The film came in, and it had basic exposure that you could use to get the photos on that film, and it it always it always didn't it never recommended that you shoot portraits looking into this with the sun behind right stuff like that whereas whereas i'm like i'm more likely to go that way i'm more likely to push that boundary rather than do what do what it wants me to what it's telling me to do because what it's telling you to do there is it's assuming that you're just like most other people who don't know how to shoot photos back then and so it's telling you the most likely way that you're going to get something usable Whereas I'm more, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go that other way. It's just how I, I like to shoot. 
So we, we, um, we now live in the age of the, of the digital camera. How, how do you use the digital camera in unconventional ways uh, today? I've got one camera where I had a filter, some kind of filter removed of it, and I can, and I can shoot infrared black and whites with it. That's pretty cool. And the, yeah, that's, those cameras, are, they're not, there's not that many of them around. You have to have them especially adapted. So that's a good example of what you were just asking about. So you, you've you gone from this world of uh, editorial p pleasing the, the others. Now you've transferred your career more into the uh, the, the arts. Your, your images don't land on the covers of magazines, but on people's walls. Um, I, I, I assume that that would be your, um, your, your, your main uh, focus uh, today. Would you say so? Pretty much, yeah, yeah. So, so with, with that said, um, how, how has that changed your, your way of, of being, your way of, uh, of, of looking at water and, and how you go about operating in the world? Um, well, art takes prior, priority, which means I chase the arty light. I'm not looking for the, the perfect front light. Like I can remember when there, there, were, there were photo editors who would not accept anything off you unless it was shot in full front lighting. They didn't care about the backlight. They didn't care about the, the cool effects that you can get by looking through the trees or whatever, whatever the case may be, right? And so uh, I kind of lost my train of thought there. What was the, what, what was the question? Uh, uh, essentially, um, how, how are you operating um, in, in, in the water differently now than you did then, and and is it um, is it more enjoyable to you as an artist? And also, does your work show that it's more progressive because you've you've taken all the that all 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 of the above? Like, um, you know, when I was shooting for surfing magazines, there's always a fair bit of uh, competition, especially when you're in the water, and that could lead to problems. In fact, it got really bad around 2003 through to about 2008. There was just hordes of water photographers descended upon, you know, back door and off the wall. Like it used to be maybe three or four photographers, and suddenly there was like 20 guys out there, all with fish eyes, all getting photos of each other. Because that's what you're going to get with a fish eye. It's got a field of view like this, you know. And so you got 20 guys out there, all they're getting is pictures of each other. They're not get they're not getting great surfing photos. So, you know, um, uh, Uh, well, yeah, being an art photographer, I don't really have to deal with competition, which is really nice, you know. If there's competition, then it's probably one of my friends who's shooting the same stuff because he likes to shoot that stuff too. But I don't, yeah, I don't really have the competition factor anymore, and and I'm just really, I get to, I get to concentrate really on only on what I want to shoot most of the time, which is, you know, it's nice, you know, it's. Uh, yeah, as a, as a surf photographer, as a sports photographer, I guess you could say I'm a little bit out, put out the pasture, but I'm not really because the quality of the quality of what I'm shooting gets better every year. Like you know, at some stage every year, I'll sit down and sort of look at what I've been shooting and I think, yes, the quality is not only still there, but it's definitely gotten better. You know, like I, I haven't really noticed it going the other way at all yet. <laughs> But you know, like the last couple of years have been a little bit quieter too with the, co the whole COVID thing. That was that kept me from shooting a fair bit because we had all kinds of rules. But um, uh, generally, though, I, I, it's much more fun being a photographer now than it was then. Although you know, back then I used to get to travel on the on the magazine's dime, and that was pretty cool because you'd get to see a lot of really cool places, you know, like really unique places. And that was one thing I, I used to get in magazines always telling me was, gee, you shoot a lot of scenery stuff, you know? Because most of the guys, they would just shoot. Poor... This is how most surf photographers would go about. They'd shoot a bunch of surfing. And they'd get they'd get down to the last day or two. And they're like, oh, I've got all I've shot of surfing. I don't have any portraits. So you, you could tell because all the portraits that they had, they're all taken within about an hour of each other. <laughs> you know, things like that. You could tell they weren't really building the the perfect shoot from the get-go. They were just 
randomly shooting and then realize getting to the end of their trip realizing oh geez i need to get a bit more of this a bit more of that and whereas when i would do a shoot i would always be looking out for all the little bits and pieces that would make it that would tell a more complete story and i, I really got that technique from um, reading surfing world magazine in australia back back in the 70s it was owned by these two photographers bruce channon and hugh mcleod who also went by the name of Aton. And these two guys owned the magazine and what they would do, they would just get together a bunch of surfers and go up the coast and do a shoot for a week or two. And they would do two or three of those shoots and fill a magazine with it. And it was such a great formula. I mean, they always had great shots. They they shot the formula, like these guys would shoot the scenery and there's a cool animal or something. They'd get a couple of shots of that animal, good, some good lineups, you know, some maybe a couple of photos of local people, things like that. That's what tells us a good travel story is to have all those visuals. So, yeah, I kind of developed my shooting style based a lot on what I saw in their magazine. And those guys were definitely doing it right because they were filling mag magazines with their own photos. They weren't having to rely too much on, on other photographers. They were using other photographers' stuff, but most of what they had in there was, was their own stuff from their own trips. Pretty good formula. What what was one of your most memorable trips that you went on? Oh, probably the first ship of Stern's Bluff shoot with Kieran Perot and Mark Matthews and Drew Courtney. Because I'd 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 known about this way. Well, okay, so when I was living in Tassie, I used to drive a lot of the coast looking for new spots. You know, just looking for new setups. And there's this one area where I, could, I just couldn't drive any further because it all got all mountainous and you could see it was like this all along the coast. And I always had a feeling that there was something down there that was pretty epic. And then I started hearing about it. Uh, well, actually, the ASP. ASP announced that they were going to have this contest in Tasmania called the Champion of Champions. And it was going to be held at Devil's Reef, which was Shipstone's Bluff. But um, in order to be in the contest, you had, all you had to do was, was, was to win a contest in the last year. So back in those days, too, they were holding a lot of contests in like one to two foot crap. So you could feasibly win a contest in one to two foot crap <laughs> and then get thrown out at, at 10, 12, 15 foot ship sterns. And so it wasn't really a good formula. It wasn't really a good idea for how to set the kind of stuff but anyway as it turned out they didn't run it funding fell through for it or something they they turned they shut it down at the last minute i was actually down there for it D didn't go ahead but um so you know I, it was in my head there for a few more years and then um just one year i thought oh i'm going to go check it out i'm going to get some guys i'm going to go scope it out so uh, I, I i got kieran perot um, and Kobe Abbott and, and Drew Courtney. And Kobe Abbott and brought his mate Mark Matthews with him. Nobody knew who Mark Matthews was back then. And so the night before we went in the ship sterns, they were, they were showing Kira, perfect Kira on the news. So Kobe Abbott has got, well, I'm going to Kira, I'm going to Queensland, I'm going to go surf Kira. So I had to take him to the airport, drop him off. And next day we walked in the ship sterns and got it pumping, you know, and that was. It's a crazy shoot. Went for a couple of days, so we were there for three weeks. After after three days, we left. It was done. It was like, well, we're not going to be better this, no matter what we find. But let's just call call it off. We're done. We, we've got a great shoot, and I think of that, off that shoot, I've got like four or five magazine covers, well over a hundred pages of editorial. I mean, it was it was the beginning of slab surfing as we know it. You know, like before, before then, there were there were these mutant waves all over the world, particularly all over Australia, that people would sit and watch and wonder whether they could surf. You know, like Cyclops or, or the Right in Western Australia, or a million other spots. Hours in Sydney, and no one was ever surfing these waves because they didn't think they could surf them. But then, you know, they surf ship sterns, and everyone's like, "Hello, let's go and check out that spot down the road." And so suddenly, everybody's just chasing these mutants, and they. They started using, by using jet skis, but then they found after a while they didn't really need the jet skis. I mean, Jaws is a good example of that. They're paddling it now. You know? They didn't think they could paddle it back then. So, yeah, the ship stones, it was a pretty big um, shoot 
which I actually followed straight off the back with a, another epic shoot on on King Island with Kelly Slater and Eddie Vedder. That was a really good little shoot too. So, um, you know, in the space of a couple of weeks, I had two two really good shoots, like just back, back to back. Is this and at the time, shoot? I'm sorry to interrupt. Is this early 2000s? Yeah, around 2000, 2001. I can't remember one or the other. Probably I, I, 2000, because I don't remember 9-11 having happened yet. So it was probably 2000. But um, I remember the magazine editor for tracks telling me that he was at the Australian Surf Photography Awards while I was on the while I was off on those shoots, and I ended up getting like five awards. And he said, he said the fifth time I went down there. I told him I'm gonna to have to grow another arm if I've got any more awards. <laughs> but yeah, I just had a really successful couple of, uh, about a month there. It was just like mega successful. Yeah. So the the ship sterns is a, a slab as 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 you say, and for those who who might not know, a slab uh, just comes up straight onto a rock and goes 90 degrees vertical. Um, and in how how do you go about swimming at these locations? Um, you uh, <laughs> you you know you roll up on on such an intense scene. Uh, maybe you've not swum at that. I have not swum ships since. I had no desire. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, not only is it dangerous, but it's super sharky. It's on a cape, and sharks love capes, especially the big ones. So, yeah, I've just really had no intention of sitting in the you know uh, the food chain let alone might get maybe getting eaten alive by a wave as well <laughs> well how well, about no guys down there who shoot it like Stuart Gibson he's he loves it can't get enough of it but yeah, well, he, he's done it enough that he's comfortable out there but you you do shoot insane waves all over the North Shore for years you have and you've gone all over the world what are what are the kind of things that go through your mind when you um, approach these uh, these uh, very intense spots. Um, what are you looking for as far as uh, how to keep well, yourself safe but still get the get the material? The bigger waves, obviously, you don't want anyone on them if you if you're shooting them out as a wave. And you know, pipeline's one of the hardest places to get empty wave shots. Like we used to actually go and swim in the contests, so so that we could shoot empty waves. Because you only had two guys out there. Is that a water housing behind you there? Up on yeah, the that's that's uh, my first water housing right there. Yeah. Was that an Aquatec? Yeah, it's an Aquatec. Yep. Yep, man. All right. Yeah, I used to work with him back in the day when he was hand making him. Yeah, this is a uh, 2005, yep. I think I got this this guy. All right. Yeah. yeah. That that dome's really good for split level shots. You know, where you get the water. I love that. What lens do you use on that one? Uh, this, uh, it's a 14, 2.8. Yeah, it'll work. This guy right here. Um, I had the 14, I, I bought it twice and I just couldn't like it. it I, love the funking, I love the funkiness of a fish eye, but what's really cool is that the Tekina, Tekina makes this 10 to 17, it's a fish eye zoom. It's such a good lens. It's so far out shoots the Canon 15. Canon 15 is like one of the worst lenses I've ever used. This this 14's nice, no, but it's, it's, it's all not funky like a fish. There's no there's but, no distortion. There's no distortion. It's all straight. Yeah, I, I know. And I, I when I first bought one, I was thinking that was going to be pretty cool, but um, it kind of seemed a little bit bland. Like I, I missed the funkiness of a fish eye. Ah, uh, you kind of like the the, curve, the curvature and stuff. It's yeah, it's all about how you tilt it. Right. And, as to how it works and stuff but um yeah the 14 will avoid that for a lot of real estate photographers love that lens because it keeps all the walls dead straight you know but when you're shooting waves that's not not as important if there's a bit of a curve that's okay because waves curved anyway but um yeah so we, 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 what were we talking about before i pointed out the fish shot yeah the uh the intensity um how you go about your your safety while oh, well, while still getting your material yeah yeah well i don't shoot water photos of the big stuff anymore i mean i'm 60 now so you know got one's got to recognize one's limits a little bit but um i still swim a lot and what i look for these days when i'm in the water is just quality I'm, it's the quality and i find the best ways to shoot in the water 
tend to be between the two to four foot range because it's not too intense underwater. It's still pretty clean, you know. There's, there's not too much flotsam, jetsam floating around. It's usually like a pool, yeah, like a clarity of a pool under underwater at that size. And and at that size, you have a lot more ability to get in position and frame it just how you want it. Whereas when it's bigger, there's less opportunity to do that because you're concentrating more on surviving. So yeah, I find that the best best places to shoot are, are like sandbars at two like two to four foot range. Um, and you know, middle of the day lighting, like behind me. That's nice, that's nice. Although also if the sun's coming up over the land, if you, you could you could be underwater looking at the waves as they go past, it's pretty cool because the sun will just it'll show through the wave. It'll twinkle, you know. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Absolutely. So, there's just so many different ways to shoot. There really is. Surf photography has a wider variety, you know, wider ga gamut of, of ways to shoot than anything I've seen. It's pretty cool. And, you know, as far as shooting first grade sports people, you know, athletes, it's like the best. Because, you know, like, I can just go and swim out and be shooting feet away from me, you know. Slater and people like that. I mean, you couldn't do that with like football or baseball or anything like that. It, you know, it's all contracted. You got to sign stuff, and no, 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 you can't use the photos for this. No, you can only give them to us. And there's none of that. You're just swimming around shooting pictures, right? And I, I do have a question in that regard. You know, you you have so much great material from the past uh, that you did um, sell to magazines. Did, does is that material now? Could you? um you know resell that as art or is that owned by the magazine that is now no no I'm, all the stuff i've all the photographs i've photographed i own i own all my material some magazines kind of got a bit weird there towards the end and they were had some weird stuff going on but um no i definitely own all my photos which is nice because especially with the film stuff because the film stuff's really there's nowhere near as much of it about that, than there, as there is with digital. And a lot of the, because simply we weren't shooting as much and there weren't as many of us shooting it. And, and so photographers are notoriously, they're notorious for not looking after their stuff. Like as far as, I'll give you an example. And there's uh, this guy, he used to live down, down the road and he had his house and he actually had to drive down a little bit down to get, to park your car and what happened was every time he got a bunch of photos back from a magazine he'd stuff them in this box at the door at the back door of his house so he had this big old box full of returns his images right and we had all this rain and his yard got flooded there was all these boxes of photos ruined just sitting in soggy boxes and you know like that's what i'm saying so photographers were, were not exactly known for being really well organized some of us some of us but not many of us most of us weren't uh, I, I was organized to the point where i could see the end coming with the magazines and, and so i was I, I was building inroads for a career after magazines you know so i started scanning my best photographs you know i bought a nikon scan i started doing scans of all, all my best slides so i already had a pretty good operating archive digitally by the time film photography ended. And that's, that's helped me a lot, having, already having had those photos ready to go, scanned and ready to go. You know, I was doing that a lot behind the scenes back in the day. Uh, over here, I've got a, dozens of plastic bags full of slides and I haven't really looked at any of them in a good 10 years. I just don't really ever need to access them that much anymore, but I have them there in case I need to. On an emotional, artistic level, does does going to that? I mean, you say you haven't looked at them in, in a number of years. Are you almost just like over it, and you want to just focus on what you're doing currently and what you've done currently and how you're progressing, um, or do you go back and and repurpose things, uh, or do you have an idea of that? How how does that work in your it's mind? It's a little bit. Of, it's a little bit of both, really. I mean, I actually haven't shot any film since 2004. Isn't that amazing? That's incredible. Yeah. I just went cold turkey straight into the digital. Uh, I've still got a bunch of film cameras. 
but I just haven't used haven't used film since two thousand and four. But yeah, I remember when I first went digital. Um, um, there was that, you know, I, I missed the tangibility of holding the slides and looking at them, and you know, being able to look at you know, have it in your hand, because digital is nothing but X's and zeros, pretty much. So yeah, I did miss that tangibility of the slide being able to hold it, but I got past it, moved on. I mean, there's a lot of great tools that have come that have come along with digital. It's made us all much more complete photographers, I think. Although there's a lot there's a lot there that aren't learning. They're just, you know, doing doing what it takes to get by, thinking that they're doing it. But really, it's a, to, to, to become better at, at photography, you've got to constantly uh, be looking beyond the obvious, you know, like um, be willing to take a few risks and get to get the shot. So t t today you do print most of your work for, for walls, for the, the physical world. Um, how does that, does, does that now bridge that that tangibility that you um that you love so much from the film now with the digital whereas a lot of kids a lot of young people today you know they'll post up their their work on uh the instagram or or facebook but they'll never yeah. actually print their their work in in a physical sense and i guess my question here is to you um do you do you recommend that 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 people who work in this space um also have an end goal or should have an end goal to the the, the print to the, the the physical oh it's a long question a lot of details on that uh well a lot of people a lot of people don't do anything with their photos and then there's a lot of people who sell their photos but then there's there's not a lot of people at all who actually print and sell their photos. When I say print and sell, I'm talking pretty big, you know, not just like this. But a lot of people could print this big, but big and big. And like I've got a machine here, and I don't know if you can see. Oh, you can't see it because I've got the background going. But it's like six foot long. It's made by Epson. It's called the Pino One Thousand. And on that machine, I can print. Um, I can print a single print as large as. 44 by 120 inches, whatever that is. So if someone had, wants a picture of three times that size, I could just do it as a triptych. <laughs> triptych is three pieces, right, next to each other. But yeah, I could pretty much print any size anybody wants. And it's, you know, as, as far as collectors go, people who collect photography or art prints, nothing, nothing really beats a signed print, especially one that was actually printed by the person. So a lot of people will get their stuff printed and sign it and then sell it. Or they'll just get it printed and shipped straight to the person so they don't even get it signed. But So the ultimate print really is one that's been both printed and signed by the artist. That, those are the, you know, the most collectible prints there are, really. And so, you know, everything I print here I sign. But that's the only stuff I do sign is what I print myself. And, and these days, uh, where, where do you find your customers? Where do you find your, your, your market? Um, social media really has been a lot of it, but it gets harder and harder with, that, with, with all the algorithms. And Instagram has been a main player, but in recent times, they've messed with it a little bit too much in trying to keep up with things like TikTok. Now it's kind of like full of videos and not just videos but a lot of mediocre videos of people that just you don't even want to see that stuff right so it's gone from being a really cool platform where you see great photography and photographers are able to utilize it in order to get their word out to a, a platform now where it's mainly video and posting pictures doesn't even seem that relevant anymore it's really weird so yeah i'm, I'm thinking somebody's about to rise above Instagram. I've got a feeling it might be LinkedIn because they seem to be making their platform more and more uh, usable on a social scale. It wasn't, it wasn't back in the day. So yeah, I've got a feeling that Instagram's about to 
to, uh, not be so much king anymore. At least not photo wise. There's going to be a, there's, there's bound to be a, a platform come out that'll be better just for photography. Yeah, they kind of they kind of blew it messing with it because it was it was epic as a photography only app. It, it was the best. And yeah, I mean I've been with Facebook forever. I've got like eighty thousand followers on Facebook, and I hardly even do anything on there anymore because of the algorithms. They messed up the they messed it up so much. Like I've got eighty thousand followers. But I'm lucky if I'm lucky if a thousand people see that message, even though they've said they want to see my stuff. And I just I kind of have a problem with that. So I'm thinking, well, I've worked really hard to build this up, and then they go and put a block like that on me because they want to make money off me. Here's the thing: I wouldn't even mind paying Facebook if I could just work out how to make it work, because they don't they don't talk to you. They don't make themselves available. They don't want to talk to us. That's why they keep it free. I'd, I'd much rather pay them 30 bucks a month or whatever, be able to pick up the phone and get something done straight away. Bam, that'd be great. Take care of biz, you know, make it work. Understand how to make it work. Yeah, I don't mind paying you guys some money if you can help sell my stuff. I'm fine with that, but I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand. Most people, when they advertise on Facebook, they're just throwing their money away. I can disagree with that. Yeah. So, yeah, social media has been a big driver of the, of the, uh, you know, the arts photography scene. I'm kind of wondering where, where, where we're going to go next on it. It's interesting. What are your thoughts on NFTs? The, um... Well, that is, a, that is an interesting thing, isn't it? Uh, I've got friends who are doing NFTs. I've got a friend in, uh, in New Jersey called Jay Alders, he's a really good surf artist. And he's been doing NFTs now for about a year and it seems like he's killing it. So yeah, I probably, I, I do, I need to get on that. I mean, I've been, build, I've been building some collections behind the scenes and stuff, but I, yeah, at some stage I just need to really hunker down on it and work it out. Cause I've definitely got the, I've got, I've got what it takes to be successful with NFTs because what you really need to be successful with NFTs is something that people want. And generally it's, it's history, it's history. And I've got plenty of that, certainly with surf photos and stuff, but I, I um, yeah. And just to interrupt, it, it touches upon what, what you just spoke about the, mm. the one of a kind from the artist where it's signed this is a digital thing that's one of a kind and for those who don't know what we're talking about non-fungible tokens mm -hmm. each picture is non-fungible it is mm -hmm. it is a one of a kind that you have the digital copy of and when, when you when you say non-fungible you got to explain that to the peeps because most people have never heard that right term. right so a dollar <laughs> dollar bill is fungible one dollar bill is interchangeable with another dollar bill however the, okay. the tahiti print behind you if you made that into an NFT, there is only one um, print from Sean Davey that is that is of Tahiti that he endorsed and and uh, uh, minted on the Ethereum blockchain that you now own and can show your friends that this is yours. And I and I personally mm -hmm. think that that's where all this is going, and that's the next step. Um, mm -hmm. And and I, I think it's uh, very very interesting. Um, I've been dabbling. Yeah, to, Pardon? Yeah, I need to get on that. I mean, I, I just know your whole catalog is just out of this world. And to own a Sean Davy cover. You should be able to make a killing, huh? Oh, bro. Um, <laughs> I had the that photo of, say, Sonny Garcia on the cover that you shot. You know, that's a one of a kind piece right there. I mean, I, I have chills going through my body just saying it. And, um, and that right there is surf history. So, I mean, that's that's uh i think that's the frontier personally mm. yeah the fact that i've also been pretty massively published helps me a lot because because what what people really look for too with nfts is is le stuff that's legitimate you know like the person's got a, a person has a history the person has a, um, a reputation the person making the images that, that kind of thing absolutely Absolutely. Also, with the images being great, that's the most important factor, I think. But 
yeah, as far as NFTs goes, that it's important to be known, so to speak. Following the NFT space at the moment, though, the photography part really isn't there yet. Like that's really not even even the people buying these things. Uh, as an artist, you'd look at these some of these pieces that people are spending. You know, if you're familiar with CryptoPunks, I um, mean, you know, that was the first NFT, but people are are spending five hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars on these little digital copies, and um, it's uh, it's kind of mind blowing. But if this is where it is going, though. Well, on a darker side of things, a lot of people use it also to move money around without being noticed by the authorities because the authorities are shut out. Like you could go and buy a house with an NFT. Yes. And no one, no one would ever know. <laughs> you know, so I think, yeah, it's becoming a, it is becoming a, a way to move large amounts of money around. But it, it, a lot of people don't don't understand the NFT thing. But from what I from what I've seen, you'd be pretty hard to lose your money because it's like it's so it's you know the, it's so locked up with the blockchain. The blockchain protects itself. Well, as an artist, every time say I wanted to sell the NFT uh, hypothetically of Sonny Garcia, you would then receive ten percent of that future sale and all future yeah, sales. I like that. I and like that. that that's brilliant. Mm, that's a good concept because it means you can keep earning you get the more art you get out there the more passive income you can create off it which is always nice passive income you can't get enough of that stuff <laughs> that's right for more yeah. time in the ocean um sean mm, exactly you you have been uh just crushing us with uh with brilliant stories and knowledge um i have uh, i have two more questions for you um mm. what what would you recommend for um, advice to anyone uh, uh, young, old, young, uh, young at heart, uh, who's looking to get into the water with a camera? Um, got to be passionate about it. If you want to be successful, you got to be passionate about it because that's what that's what will get you through. I mean, that's pretty much what got me th where I got to. It was just just because I lived it. I loved it, you know. I've always loved doing it. And so when, when it's like that, you don't quibble about money and you don't, you don't care about this or that. You just, you just care about getting out there and doing it. And I think, you know, some people might take advantage of that a bit. And you certainly the more, the, the more better, the better you get at something and the more known you get, and the more knowledge you gain on the people in the industry around you, the more you'll see things where you're like, yeah, I don't really agree with that. But back in the day, I wouldn't have cared because I didn't know. So, you know, there's a bit of that. But ultimately, you know, if you want to get ahead, it doesn't matter what you do. Play football, baseball, be a photographer. It doesn't matter. You've just got to be passionate about it. Those are, those are the people that generally they probably you know, have a bit of an artistic streak. It always helps. <laughs> Although, you know, I never really embraced the whole art concept too much until after my magazine career or towards the end of my magazine career because I could see the writing, the, the writing on the wall. But I've always had, a, I've always had that, you know, that arty-farty thing going on. So that's helped me move over to, you know, far, you know much more wider percent of my income comes from my art now than Whereas it used to mainly come from magazines. So let me let me ask you this though: When you were um, a photographer working for the magazines, um, internally in the self, you didn't view yourself as an artist. Is that is that what I'm gathering? Not as much. No. I mean, well, I never worked for the magazines. I worked with them. So I've always been my my own boss. I've never really had too many things told that I've got to do. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, sorry, I, miss, I, I lost. What yeah, I it, it was more of a question of, um, of how you um, in, internalize what you're doing. You know, you, uh, yeah. you now are an artist, you call yourself an artist, you think like an artist, you operate in the world as an artist. Then you were, you were not, and that's my question here, were you not an artist? Or were you not an artist and you just didn't know it? 
I was partially an artist. The, the, I mean, that wasn't that wasn't the the main deal then was just to shoot surf. You know, I was shooting surf, especially getting in the water as much as I could. You know, but the art, the art finds you if you've got a, if you if you have a like an artistic streak. The, the moments they find you. It's like some of my best photos come from just being somewhere at the right time and and happening and happening to have the equipment in hand like get an example might be i'll get up in the morning i'll go to i'll go to shoot this shore break and i'll be shooting waves and suddenly i look over my shoulder and there's a there's a massive rainbow going on behind me so i'll i'll turn that wave and get get a get a photo that way of a, of a different wave different light but there's a rainbow behind it and never would have got that shot had i not been there shooting this way looking at this so yeah, a lot of my best shots have come from simply being there, and they're typically the the more atmospherical shots are like that—the ones with the, you know, the heavy rainstorms that create the crazy rainbows and what have you. The, the full moon shots, not so much. I actually went to shoot those, but you know, generally those the atmospherical shots are, they they tend to come to me. Yeah. So your, your your process then, in a nutshell, is go and be. And, and do and let the nature come to you in the process of being there and not come come to it with some predisposed idea of what you're going to do. I mean, you have your toolkit of, of tools, but that you whip out when you see what you're going to see, but it is the doing that is the secret. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, uh, I Sometimes I might have difficulty just working out what I'm going to what I'm going to shoot with. Am I going to use a fisheye? Am I going to use a hundred millimeter? Am I going to use an SLR? Am I going to shoot for land? Am I going to shoot for water? Am I going to use a drone? I mean, yeah. How do you those, work that out? What's you, that? You flip a coin? Like you, you go with no, one? no, no, no. I just no, no. There's no need to flip a coin. I just pick something. Pick something and go and run with it. You know. Oh, yeah, like, for example, it might be better today to shoot underwater photos, but ah, screw it. I feel like shooting the drone today. I'm going to go shoot the drone. <laughs> yeah, when you're an artist, you don't, you only have to please yourself. You don't have to please. There's no bosses to please, generally speaking. Um, you know, so just do. If you're going to be a photographer, just do it with a passion. It doesn't matter what you do. Yeah, the, the cream rises to the top, so to speak, I guess. Yeah, although it's much harder these days because, you know, um, maybe it's easier, you know, because I, I, I've got old experiences in my head here that I'm leaning back on and maybe they're not relevant to younger people who've never had those experiences. And maybe for these younger people, it's easy to make a living. I don't know. Maybe it is, you know, because there's a... There's so many different ways to sell your photos and you know there's only so many hours in the day <laughs> so um yeah, maybe uh, it's just changes from person to person it's it's so much more it seems like we're busier than ever you know uh yeah it's um I just find that, yeah, I tend to be busier than ever, but um, I look I look back and I think, God, I'm sure I wasn't working as hard before. You know, why, why do we, it seems like we're doing more. Good example, you know, like uh, when you went to the bank, when you went to do your banking, you had to go to the bank and take your checks and then give them to the person to be on the counter or put them in the machine or whatever. That, that meant getting in the car and driving down 10 miles down the road and doing that and come back. You've lost an hour in a day. You can do that now on your phone. A couple of minutes, bam. So I was saying, we're, we're doing so much more than we've ever done because we have so much technology at our fingertips. So yeah, it seems like we're, we're busier than we've ever been. And we're getting more and more done than we've ever done. But it still kind of doesn't, I don't know. You think that would equate to more money, more and more uh, uh, security, right? But I think, you know, especially when you're in art circles 
it's uh, you know uh, the guys that are making the good coin every week they're not really doing art they're working for somebody right whereas when you're an artist you tend to you know the money comes and goes sometimes it comes in a lot sometimes it doesn't you never really know so there's no guarantee all I, got, all I can do really is just get my work out to as many people as I can that I trust that I trust to work with um, yeah but yeah be passionate about whatever you're doing if you're a photographer you yeah unless you've got contacts and someone's going to get get you a job and that happens a lot of people <laughs> a lot of that does go on I mean it's just how it is right it's a capitalistic society <laughs> but um from a just from a uh, you know uh, from my point of view yeah you know, if you if you just really love what you do it, it'll it'll work itself out some way generally and, you know if you, you're not screwing up yourself like you know you're not an alcoholic or something you know something that's messing your life up because a lot of people they fail because of stuff like that too so it's just about um, uh, being good at what you do and looking after yourself I guess and great, hopefully great it all advice. comes together let's mm. let's uh take let's build off that off that and and go on to this final question what is the meaning of life to Sean Davey Difficult question because I could go off in so many different directions there. Um, <sighs> what do you reckon? Question to you. <laughs> Maybe I ask it differently. <laughs> ask it the what's important differently. to you? Oh, what's important to me? Just, just being, being continuing to be creative and 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 uh and and make people's homes nice with my pictures <laughs> i think i've probably got probably my work is hanging in thousands of homes i mean really thousands so, so i guess in that respect i'm a i'm a successful artist i would say so and and um where do you find more, um, I guess, satisfaction your, in all the covers you've made or all the walls that you've uh, watered? Hmm. Well, back then it was the covers, now it's the pictures on the walls. <laughs> so, it's a bit of both, I guess. What a life. It's funny, I had, I had like 180 magazine covers. It's just unfathomable. I can't believe I had that many. Like, I, I thought I had about 140, then I found this stash of covers that i'd forgotten about i'm like oh shit, there's another 40 right there jeez you know it, to get a cover now is just downright impossible you can't do it actually I was, I was talking to a guy who used to work for one of the magazines and he laid it out really well he said look this is when surfing and surfer was still available right he said look do you get surfer or surfing sent to you at, at your home I said yeah i think uh, surfer comes yeah he says, so how much are you paying a year for that? Oh, it's what, about 10 bucks a year, right? I think 10 bucks a year, they print it and ship it to me. Do you think they're making money on you? No. The only people they're making money off are the advertisers. They are the only people they need to worry about. I said, that is so true, you know. And so it got to the point where the, where the magazines were suffering from quality of photos because advertisers would be coming in and looking at the photos, they're going, Oh well, yeah, that's a great tube and all, but we don't care about that. We care. We 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 really care that the board shots are really visible. And we want to use this picture of him taking off, and so like suddenly, shitty photos were like being used being used in the magazines where it should have been a good photo, you know. And that's I, mean, I even remember you could. Uh, Rusty was offering five thousand dollars if you could get a cover of any of the American mags with their their surfers. I mean, there's there's been all kinds of funny things like that over the years. 
but yeah, they basically the magazines went away because the quality of them just declined to a point where nobody really cared that much anymore. Uh, they still do in Australia. Well, see what happened here was Surfer and Surfing were owned by one company, and so they got they eventually got rid of one of the mags, but they eventually got rid of the other one as well. Um, the magazines in Australia, sur Tracks, Surfing World, and Surfing Life they're all still running because when the big companies that owned those magazines decided there wasn't any margins in it anymore the editors stepped up and said well, we'd like to take the magazine off your hands and keep the mags going we'd like so the magazines have very much gone back to cottage business you know very small very small outfits just a few people at each magazine whereas they used to have maybe 20 or 30. So the three magazines are still there. They're not coming out every month anymore. They may be coming out every three or four months. Uh, but they're, qual they're good quality magazines. They, they charge a lot more for them because the advertising is not paying those bills. Because you know, if you put quality stories in the magazine, it's not necessarily what the advertiser's looking for. The advertiser's looking for what we call advertorial. The, the a photo that shows the product really well that's that's advertorial and this one i mean there's one guy telling me he said look 10 pages of advertorial is the same as one page of editorial so that's that's how bad the magazines got before they followed it eventually the american max they were just they were full of advertorial you know like uh, when the magazines were at their height you'd have maybe Every magazine would have one or two trips in there that the magazines funded for someone to go away and shoot, right? But they'd be great. They'd be good magazine. You could sit there and read a magazine for a couple of hours. You look at a magazine, the last few that came out before they closed, five minutes, you're done. It's that quick. It's just, it wasn't the same. And you know, like uh, back in the day when you had maybe two, two travel editorials, what what did we have in the last few magazines? Not so much travel editorials, but buying guides. So instead of a ten pages on some exotic place that we all buy the magazine to look at to to want to go there, right? Now we're getting ten pages of wetsuits that we can buy, or ten pages of surfboards, or ten pages of shit that we can put on our car. You know, it's like it's and all that is being paid for by the advertisers oh yeah we'll be in your buyer's guide how much that kind of cost okay yeah we'll do that yeah so it went from they went from being really great magazines that we wanted to read to to being magazines that was just full of product and mediocre photos i mean there was great photos actually i wouldn't say all the photos in the surf mags were mediocre there's still there's great photography still being produced and so they would use some of them but it wasn't all great photography Still a lot of fair bit of mediocre stuff going on there. That's really why. And what, so what happened with American mags is the avatar, uh, the people, the companies that own them simply just wanted to get out of the game, so they let them go. And I guess the editors that worked for them either didn't care enough to want to take them over, or the avatar, or the companies wanted too much money for them. But there were three big magazines here. There was Surfer surfing and transworld surf they were all pretty big mags and they all folded well, in about space of a year maybe two and surf or surfing had really long histories they were from the 60s from the 60s i also read those mags in australia yeah we used to get them on australian newsstands you know? so yeah it's it's changed a fair bit um i wouldn't i wouldn't want to tell people to go out there and be a surf photographer but by all means be a photographer and see where it takes you and if you can be a surf photographer well, good luck to you power to you but it's <laughs> yeah it's not quite as easy as it was when i jumped in when i jumped in there wasn't many surf photographers either there's only a handful of us like i can remember when i was still living in australia and someone wanted to do an article on me simply because i was a water photographer you know, it was, there's a million of us out there now. Look how many Aquatex there are. There's a lot of Aquatex. Um, but to bring it full, full circle, like you like you said earlier, it's all about the going and the doing and then the, the making. It's, uh, you know, 
you can buy all the equipment in the world. Uh, but if you're not using it and, and, um, like a, like a sword, you're, um, you're just used to have some stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's a lot of people got a stuff. lot of stuff. Very right? expensive stuff. Yeah. A lot of people out there have got a lot of stuff. I know some photographers who've got so much equipment and they just keep buying it. I'm like, dude, just use that camera. That's going to do the job. You know, no, 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 I've got to go get the lotus. The lotus. I mean, these people who've got red cameras, you know how much those things cost? Red cameras are like, what, 20, 30 grand or something? And people are buying them just like a, as a camera. You know, it's like, uh, unless you've got a client, a commercial client that's paying you really good money, you would never buy a camera like that unless you're just rich, you've got more money than sense, you know? I'm, like my cameras, I'm using a Canon EOS 5DS and 5DSR. They're 50 megapixels. They're, they're not the be all and end all sports cameras by any means, but they will produce crazy quality photographs. And that's all I care. All I care is just get nice quality, as good quality as I can shoot. So you can go big and put it on the wall. Huge. Or I mean, even my drone, I can do that now. I've got a it was a DJI Phantom 4 Pro. That's actually even in even in a drone world. That's quite an old drone, but everybody I know who drones says that's one of the best drones. It takes the best photos, and that's all I care for is to get pictures. I don't not really interested in videoing with it. Yes. Uh, I, what I what I like when I'm using a drone. What I like about it is its ability to get the shot that you can't otherwise get, especially looking straight down shots. Because those are like, you're never going to see that unless you're up in the air looking yep. down. You know, and I used to get those shots when I was shooting from helicopters, and you know, yep. now I can just do it with a drone. <laughs> you know, I used to I used to hire the helicopters back in the late nineties for I think three hundred bucks an hour, three hundred dollars an hour. Now they're like two thousand bucks an hour. It's so expensive to charter. But yeah, I I, I used to have a budget with uh, Tracks Magazine in Australia. And, you know, they, they budget me, I think, a thousand bucks every year that I could just sit on knowing that it's there if I needed it. And I could pull the plug and go, OK, let's go. We're going to take the bird up. It's going to be good, you know. And sometimes I went years without using that budget because I didn't want to give them anything mediocre. I only wanted to give them the best stuff I could shoot. So sometimes I just didn't use it, you know. It's, every year is different. Yeah. Well, well, Sean, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. Uh, this has been an incredible conversation. You're a, a true legend. And thank you so much for your incredibly valuable time, knowledge, and, uh, and storytelling uh, here today with us. Well, thank you, Sean. <laughs> Sean one Sean to another. I'm, I'm sorry, what? From one Sean to another. Yes, yes. The, the Shawnees connect. It's... Uh, very very epic i i finally got to got to meet you and talk with you and if anyone wants to see my stuff just go to seandavy.com the links will be down below in the description oh, yeah. smash up the likes hit the subscribe button and then the notification bell i have to say all that stuff for the youtube and um with all that said this has been episode 12 of speaking from water again i'm sean Ruke. we have been speaking with sean davy the legendary surf photographer from the Haloa state of Hawaii, formerly of Australia and Tasmania. And, and um, Tasmania, Australia. Tasmania, Australia. Yes. Excuse me. With all Island that said, state. the Haloa state. And um, thank you very much again. And we'll see you next time with uh, speak from Speaking with Water. All right. Shaka <laughs> bra. Sean, Sean, so, so grateful for your time again, and, and, and thank you very much. No worries. Oh, when you, when you have it up, send me a link and I'll promote it for you. I'm, I'm sorry. When, when, you I, have, when, you, when you put it on. Yeah. When you, I'm, have, uh, when you put. I'm going to put this uh, together. I, I got to like process it and um, I got to go look for a car tomorrow. Then Friday is my day. I think I'm going to have time. So by the weekend. You're probably going to need some pictures, huh? Uh, you know, with, with this whole thing, my, my kind of process is more of the, of the mental, the, the, it goes to Apple podcasts. So it's all an audio sensation. The, oh, YouTube, okay. 
the YouTube is just another platform for it to go to. So I don't really spend too much time like image dropping um, visuals on there. You know, you get the both of us. So and, I can get the something chicken at. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, they, they need to go to your site. They need to go yeah. to your Instagram feed. And then the, all that's in the, in, in the description below. Mm. All right, cool. Yeah, yeah. But um, uh, I hope to to be out in Hawaii again someday, um, sooner than later, and I'll. I'll Elaine said she thought she thought you looked familiar. Oh really? Yeah. I I've you know I've been I've been there a lot. I uh, I went to the um that uh, elementary school art show. Um, you you know how they do the 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 um. Yeah, I never day. actually went to that. Yes, the one where all the surfers go to. Yeah, the Wadamea Valley um, yeah. art show. Uh, I, I went to that a number of years in a row. And Kathy Shanley, who is, uh, uh, they're the people I stay with, the Shanleys. They live down um, near backyards. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, so maybe maybe we've crossed paths. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, quite possible, especially if you're out surfing here. Yeah. She's all out surfing. Yeah. Very good. Hey, it's an alley. Time to get up, buddy. Yeah. Are you gonna get your, Are you getting wet today? Tested. Oh, look at that little doggy. Nah, not today. I I I, uh, I tripped on this uh, rusted out chain link fence the other day and cut my leg all up, so I've got to let it heal. Mm. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> Which is funny because I was thinking about that just the day before. How well, how bad would it be to cut my leg up on this thing? And <laughs> you know, I did it the next day. Prophecy. Yeah. 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 All right. All right. Well, thank you again very much. We'll, okay. we'll stay in contact, and I'll I'll uh, I'll send you the links when when I post it up. Okay. All right, buddy. All right. Thanks, Sean. Respect, Sean. Bye, bye.